Hello, uh, my name is Farida Vadamosi. Um, I am a black American woman with brown skin. I have black dreads. I am wearing gold dangling earrings. Um, I am wearing a gray top that is striped. Um, in my background is the color peach and black and some colorful post-its and a window. Um, and I'm so excited to have you here at the Athena Film Festival. On behalf of the Barnard of Barnard College and Women in Hollywood, it is my honor to welcome you to the 11th Annual Athena Film Festival. This festival is dedicated to celebrating the stories of bold, courageous women leaders and the filmmakers who bring these stories to life. Thank you for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Farida and I'm what, the programmer for Athena Film Festival. This year's festival would not be possible without the support of our dedicated sponsors. Please join me in thanking Athena's founding sponsor, the Artemis Rising Foundation, and its CEO and founder, Regina K. Scully, whose visionary leadership makes our work possible. A special thank you as well to our premier level sponsor, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which shares our commitment to showcasing stories of women in science. To all of our sponsors, thank you for your commitment to challenging our culture to be more inclusive and inspiring audiences in the process. This year, we wanted to create something new and exciting to bring to our audiences. So we crafted these eight different program areas that we believe react and respond to our current moment. This conversation is part of our Nothing About Us Without Us program area. This rally and cry, which began in the disability rights movement in South Africa in 1993, has since been applied to multiple movements and causes. In this program area, we dive into representation and how in these times of great change, we must keep asking, who is this change serving and who is leading? This conversation, which is a roundtable discussion on indigenous representation and storytelling, we, uh, falls very heavily into that concept of nothing about us without us. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator, Cass Gardner, who will be moderating this conversation and will introduce our panelists. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome. My name is Cass Gardner. I am Anishinaabe Algonquin from Kebowak First Nation, with family also from Nipissing First Nation in what is now today called Quebec, Canada. Um, I have been a filmmaker and a curator working in Indigenous content for the last 12 years. Um, and I recently produced a short documentary uh, called Jules Hunt, which was on PBS last year. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking to all of these, this powerhouse panel of um, <laughs> people who are working in the indigenous uh, media and space. So I'd like everyone to please briefly just do uh, a really quick introduction um, and a bio of yourself. Uh, we can start with Shandine, please. Hello, my name is Shandine Tome and I am currently in Albuquerque New Mexico, which is on Tula lands. Um, I am in my office. I have like a pink blanket. I'm wearing a white shirt. I have brown mid-length hair. Uh, my office is really messy. So um, yeah, uh, and I have a uh, brown skin. Um, I am a Diné filmmaker. Um, both my parents are Navajo born um, in Crown Point and Ship Rock. Um, and yeah, I guess I've just been kind of working in film for a little bit, still trying to figure out exactly what I'm doing in it. My focus is going to be more in narrative content, but um, I do a lot of doc work too. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be amongst this panel with all these great people. I'm really excited about it. Hi, I am Kennedy Della Serna. I am native Hawaiian. I have tan olive skin. My hair is dark brown. I am um, in a room with some two windows, um, some flowers on some books and a lamp. Um, I am Polynesian, native Hawaiian. And uh, my recent work that just came out was Once Upon a River. I'm an actress and a filmmaker. And I am very excited to be here at the Athena Film Festival with this great panel. So thank you very much. Hi, I think I'm next. Uh, my name is Val Redhorse Mole. Um, I am clearly older than everyone else on the panel. Uh, and in fact, PBS calls me one of their veteran filmmakers, which I think means old. Um, I am Cherokee ancestry, but today I come to you from the Moekma Ohlone lands of Northern California, where I teach part-time at Stanford University. 
Um, today I am wearing a beige jacket with um, turquoise jewelry that was given to me. Everything I have on was a gift, as well as the Pendleton blanket behind me was a gift from one of the tribes that I worked with. I have very long, um, dark hair, and I have my own production company I have for many years called Red Horse Native Productions. I'm also an investment banker and securities professional and a CFO. Um, and so I'm really focused on racial equity and racial justice in our capital markets, as well as filmmaking. And the latest film that I made uh, was about Wilma Mankiller for PBS. I've made about 20 films in my career, um, but this one was a particular favorite. It, we screened at the Athena Film Festival and her message is just super powerful as an indigenous woman leader, um, actually as a leader of any type. And so I'm thrilled to be here today uh, with this esteemed group to talk more about uh, filmmaking and indigenous um, issues and Wilma in particular. Thank you. Can I just start by saying Val, wow. Um, it's like two full careers you've got that is incredibly impressive. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Tracy Deer and I'm a Mohawk writer director. I am coming to you from our traditional territory. I'm from Ganawage Mohawk territory, which is just outside of Montreal in the province of Quebec within Canada. I am sitting in a beautiful sunlit alcove in my house. I have a big window behind me that is very bright with the sun reflecting off of the snow we still have outside. And I'm wearing one of my favorite blazers. It's a purple velvet blazer. Um, I have long brown hair and my husband says my skin color is cafe au lait. Uh, is how he describes it. And I, in the winter months, I have to say it's a little more milk than coffee. Uh, and I'm wearing some, some beaded earrings that uh, I love very, very much. Um, I am here at the Athena Film Festival with my first narrative feature. It's called Beans. And it is very much inspired by my own coming of age story that took place during um, a very big indigenous uprising that happened here in Canada that has since been called the Oka Crisis. And I'm really, really thrilled to, to be here with these incredible women to talk about um, what we're gonna talk about. So thank you for having me. Um, Sayo, my name is Shay Vassar. Uh, I am a film critic, a writer of all sorts. I dabble in a lot of social media content and really am passionate just about indigenous representation in media and uh, showing a authentic representation in media. So I'm honored to be here today with people that I really look up to um, and who are in different parts of the media world. Um, I am a lighter skinned uh, Cherokee woman who has long, uh, dark hair. I'm wearing a dark brown blazer and a black shirt underneath. I have on some gold jewelry, including gold hoops um, that were made by a uh, friend of mine who is Cherokee and Kiowa named uh, Lauren Waters. She's a wonderful metalsmith. So uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm also coming from as of yesterday, the Cherokee Nation officially was uh, recognized after the McGirt ruling. So I can officially say that I am on Cherokee Nation's reservation. However, it is also the traditional homelands of the Osage. So I also wanna honor them. I just realized that I didn't do my audio thing. Um, is that... Should I do something about that? I can do it right now really quickly. And I also um, mispronounced your name, Shundine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so I'll just, since we're recording, I'm just gonna do it again really quickly, if that's okay. Oh, hold on. Okay, great. I'm just gonna do it really quickly and then we'll jump into questions, I apologize. Hi, um, Ani, my name is Cass Gardner. Um, I'm Anishinaabe Algonquin from Kebwek First Nation with family from Nipissing First Nation in what is currently called Quebec, Canada. Um, I'm a filmmaker and curator working in indigenous uh, media and I'm very excited to be here and have this conversation. Uh, my background is a very eclectic library that is my in-laws. So I'm not sure um, of everything that is here. Um, and uh, I'm wearing a pinstripe shirt and my hair is in braids and I have um, gotten a sunburn. So my skin is a bunch of different shades of brown, white, and red, and I'm currently coming to you from um, Mexico City. Okay, great. <laughs> um, 
All right, let us begin. So I'm gonna open it up. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think that this should just be like kind of a really casual conversation. Please feel free to jump in. Um, I'm just gonna open it up to kind of, uh, we have everybody here who's really, um, has been doing a lot of really amazing work in film, television, um, and writing about film and television. So I was just wondering, if uh, just to kind of break the ice, we could all talk about the thing that got us really invested in uh, wanting to create media from an indigenous perspective and a lens. Um, since I'm going in order, we can start with Shandeen. Is this like, um, sorry, could you um, state the question again? Is it more like our uh, like our inspiration of work that got us interested or like our personal work that like, like pushed us into like wanting to make more of like the same thing, I guess. I guess I'm just curious of, um, like I think that indigenous storytelling is such a, storytelling is just really embedded in our DNA. And I'm always curious as to what makes people want to be um, not so, easy uh, and traditional route of getting into film. For example, um, I remember when I was in university, I took a native studies course at NYU, which was a mistake um, probably in itself. But uh, the the way that the professor was talking about indigenous peoples, it was in the past tense, it was so frustrating. And I just remember that made me really want to create content because I was like, we need to show what contemporary indigenous people look like. And it's sometimes the only way that people interact with indigenous populations, I think, um, in certain places. And that's obviously a very broad generalization. And um, I was born and raised in the United States in New York. So I think that that's specific to New York City as well. But that's kind of my like uh, impetus to get into the media and film background. So I was just wondering if um, that resonates with you in any way and what was kind of the reasoning? Yeah, um, I guess I kind of have a whole bunch of different reasons as to why I got into film, but I feel like one of my most vivid memories comes from when I was a lot younger um, and I would go to my grandma's house on the reservation and my cousins would come along and we would call it Grandma Cindy Camp. And so it was my brothers, my cousins, and we would always just be there creating, whether it was movies or like plays or doing songs or going out to the mesa or being in the ditch and playing around but i remember specifically like my grandma had this tv and it was like a vcr player and she had this um comedic duo of uh two navajo people uh and they were so funny like all the jokes that they had were hilarious and just like so personal and me and my cousins we were like all under the age of like 10 but we like got it we understood everything and I wouldn't say it was so much as in like that moment, but it was more so after the fact in realizing that I, I guess like the reason why we were laughing so much, like with my grandparents or with my mom and dad or that sort of thing was because it was such a personal experience. Uh, and knowing that now makes me like really glad that I had that source of like inspiration to look up to and just like being like, this is home, like in like a VCR tape or whatever and realizing like that's kind of what I wanted to do in the future was like be able to tell stories that could hit people personally and really tell like my own perspective and like within sharing that perspective you really um, I guess just like have a targeted I don't want to say audience but I guess just like a targeted perspective that people can draw from and like be inspired by um, so yeah I would say that great uh, Kennedy how about you? Hi, yes. So I think I got into it because to, to become closer to my father. Um, and it's a, such a deep question. So it's really interesting um, to, to think about it. Um, what I really think that I got into it is because not growing up in, in, on my native land, so in Hawaii, there was this disconnect from a lot of our family. Um, there's not a huge Polynesian community out here either. And so one thing that I would hear is just stories from my dad talking about how talk story and all the big um, 
just family gatherings of all of our families telling stories and dancing. Um, and he, he was a dancer himself and a, a creator, and he's been in a few films. He's a filmmaker as well. Um, and so I think when I was younger, I really wanted to feel that connection to him and our culture. And growing up, you, I didn't see much representation of, you know, Polynesian women who are, you know, strong, feminine and uh, represented really well. All you hear about Hawaiians is they eat pineapple and, you know, they wear grass skirts and they dance like this. And that's all I really had growing up and, and not being next to my tutu pua and, and my family, it was really difficult. So I think I really wanted to explore storytelling and talk story and, and be a voice for um, strong female um, in the Polynesian and like Hawaiian community. And so that's where I got started and, and my journey began with all of this. Thank you so much for sharing. That's really beautiful. And that really also resonates with me as well. I grew up um, off a uh, reservation and in a, a different country um, just because my parents had to relocate for work. So. I think that I also use film as a tool to kind of learn more about um, a culture that I was separated from. And um, something that you said also made me think of an interesting kind of um, parallel perhaps um, with Tracy's work, because I know that Tracy, you've made a, a large canon of work, which I've been very privileged to see. Um, and you've really, kind of what Kennedy's saying, she's using hers as a way to um, kind of go beyond the surface um, of a community that she wasn't necessarily a part of. And you've kind of, um, in a different direction, really used your filmmaking and your documentaries, um, and even Mohawk Girls, the series on PTN, to go beyond the surface, but in a community that you know very well. Um, so I'm just gonna pass that over to you. Yeah, it's interesting that that's what I was thinking is um, for me, a lot of my work is to explore issues that I've I've grown up with. Um, and a lot of that being, you know, very specific themes that I, I've struggled with growing up in my community in terms of um, the politics of belonging, um, a modern indigenous identity, uh, you know, blood quantum and this this. The, the, the exclusionary by, byproduct of colonialism that our communities are grappling with and how much harm and pain it causes. I've, I've seen it happen to people I love around me and it makes me, it makes me so mad. Um, I, feel, I feel like filmmaking and telling stories has been a way to process um, a lot of a lot of that emotion and I hope that it gives people the place to to go and process their own emotion. I hope that it motivates conversation. I, I often hope as well that it entertains and provides laughter and a, for me as a child, so I wanted to be a filmmaker ever since I was 12 years old and it was because movies, they were a, they were a place of refuge. They were a place that I could go and feel my feelings safely because one of the things within my community and this, this, I think this is, is in other indigenous communities, but I think it's also within the bigger world as well. Um, I, I definitely grew up with this notion that our feelings made us weak. And as indigenous people, we had to be tough and we had to be tough because of everything that the world had thrown at, thrown at us up until that point. So um, there was just a lot of emotional repression and movies provided the safe space for me to feel my feelings. So I fell in love with the medium when I was 12, but I definitely did not think that I could be telling stories about my own people. I just didn't see it. I didn't see it on the small screen. I didn't see it on the big screen. So the original dream did not involve telling our own stories because it just wasn't happening. So once I graduated from university, came back to Canada for a summer, the Aboriginal People's Television Network, which is a national network up here that is for Indigenous people by Indigenous people, all of a sudden opened up an entirely new possibility to, to tell stories that come straight from my heart was mind blowing. Um, and so I, my first documentaries was, was with 
the Aboriginal People's Television Network. And I've been doing that ever since for 20 years. Um, and it's just been such a wonderful gift, even just for myself as a, as a modern Indigenous woman to sort of try to figure out my place in the world. A lot of the themes in my work continue to explore explore that as, as well as many other themes as well. Um, but yes, I'm sort of digging into my own community to, to understand it and understand my place in it and understand, you know, why we are the way we are. We, where we're dealing with a lot of difficult, a, diff, a, diff, a lot of difficult issues in our communities, a lot of them imposed upon us. Um, so it's, it's provided, it's provided something for me personally, but I do hope that that the films I put out, the, the, the projects I put out, um, provide something not only for an indigenous audience, but also for an outside audience. You know, a big, a big part of my goals with my work is to, is to also build bridges because until the outside world welcomes us and it's safe for us, um, it's just very difficult. It's very difficult to be an indigenous person in this, in this, on this continent. And I remember what it was like to be a teenager. I remember what it was like to be a young, a young woman. And I just want better. I want better for all of us. And so I think that the, the work that we make has the power to do that. And that's definitely what I'm trying to do. Wow, thank you. I love that. Feeling your feelings safely through film. <laughs> That's a really beautiful slogan. And I think that that, um, I mean, I think that comes across in your work without a doubt, of course, like the, um, I had just watched Beans, which was a phenomenal film. And also just this idea of like um, toughness that's imposed upon you as part of an identity, but it's really a safety blanket. It's a way to, to um, not get hurt when the outside world is full of so much ignorance and hatred um, for just existing. So, um, and it also made me think of the idea of, um, it's been mentioned a few times, but the idea of audience. Um, and I'm just wondering, especially like, sorry, I'm going a little off topic here, but Val, it just makes me think you have a huge canon of work on PBS and this idea of audience, um, making something for PBS, for example. And um, you also made a film that was um, very much about a community and a community's response to a particular person. So I'd like to pass the mic to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, I would have to say, you know, in answer to your question, and I'll get to the audience in a minute, when I started, I also decided around the age of 12 or 13 that I wanted to be in this industry. But keep in mind that, you know, I got into the industry 40 years ago. And I, so I went to UCLA, I majored in film and television and theater, and it was a great environment, but I tried to go through what we called the studio system back then. Keep in mind, we did not have Amazon, we did not have Netflix. It was really, if you wanted to be in film uh, or TV, you had to go through the studio system. And so I thought I would get a job working initially as an actress uh, for a big studio. And so I started auditioning as an actress and every single screenplay handed to me was stereotypical, broken English. And I finally was turned down for a role because the director, a white man, said, you sound too educated to play a Native woman. And I went home and I was ranting to my husband, this is so unfair. Why would they think that Native women aren't educated? I graduated with honors and I'm proud of that. And he said to me, and my husband's a white male, and he's actually really helped me understand that we we can stand up for ourselves and take ownership of who we are and be proud of it and not be intimidated. And he said, well, then write your own screenplays, start your own company. And so, you know, I teach entrepreneurialism and we find gaps in the market in any business. And so for me, it wasn't that I was going to start my own production company and make films, you know, that wasn't my original idea, but when I realized no one was going to hire me with the content I wanted to see, I realized I had to create it myself. So I wrote my first screenplay. It was a CBS um, after school special that propelled me to Sundance. Um, but as my script started to be produced, I was really disappointed sometimes with the direction because they weren't hiring the indigenous directors. There really weren't any at the time. So then I decided I had to start my own company and just produce, write, direct, 
and star in my own films. And so that's what I did with um, Naturally Native was my first film about my identity. Um, it was a feature film, it went to Sundance the same year Smoke Signals did, probably before some of you were born. But bottom line is I realized that this, is, this was the way of the future that as indigenous storytellers, we had to control the content, we couldn't let anyone else do it. And it fused alongside my activism um, when we talk about audience, uh, because I realized we have a big message um, to carry and it's also very educational. So I like Tracy, I want my message to be a uniter, not a divider. So, you know, I covered issues in my first film about tribal gaming and tribal identity and enrollment and, and adoption and all these, in fact, someone said, you know, how come you didn't put anything in about the military? And it's like, well, I wasn't trying to put issues in, I was just covering my life story. And so as I gravitated from narrative to documentary, to your question, Cass, I realized that audiences were hungry for the real stories. And I first did the, the co-talkers, the true whispers about the co-talkers in both World, One, World War I and World War II who had been left out of history books. And I, this last film I did was about Wilma Mankiller and we ended up showing it in Congress for a bipartisan screening to talk about servant leadership and what our leaders really should be focused on, not just getting reelected, but like Wilma in serving a community. And so, you know, to kind of wrap up your point, when I think of filmmaking, I can't separate it from calls to action, uh, social justice messages, um, that's just my calling because I think storytelling is the best way to unite and bring alongside. Um, and when we use words right now broadly, like white supremacy and colonialism, those scare some people. But we don't have to be afraid of those. I think it's it's really about shedding the light. And for years with me growing up, the media perpetuated an idea that leaders in our communities, bank presidents, doctors, um, people in politics were all white males because of how they were portrayed. So now that we're trying to fix a broken system, we have to understand media plays a huge part in that because it played a part in the, in the brokenness of the systemic bias. And so I know I've given a lot <laughs> in that answer, but I'm very passionate about the tools we all have in our communities to make a difference and to continue to seek um, strong communities through storytelling. So I'm just really happy to be here. Thank you. No, please. If that's what you think is like going too long, please go too long all the time. <laughs> that was, um, yeah, no, I, I totally uh, agree with you um, to the, to all those points. And I think that it, it brings up something that I'm just kind of interested in. Um, oh, actually, well, since we have Shay here, <laughs> I don't want to lose you again. So I would love for you. I know that you're not necessarily a filmmaker, per, uh, but you write about film, which is a crucial part of the whole media uh, landscape. And it's really important that we have indigenous voices to contextualize and criticize and write about the content that we're making too. So I'm so excited to have you on board. And I'd love to just hear a little bit about how you got into um, criticism of film. All right, we'll give her a chance to <laughs> respond when she comes back, the perils of 2021. <laughs> um, so, all right, I'm gonna kind of jump back. I'm sorry for the kind of scatteredness of this right now, but um, so I'm, I'm thinking about how we're, we're all talking about how there was a need for um, an, an indigenous, perspective behind and in front of the lens. And I was just wondering, as someone who's also worked in the industry, just, um, I guess, the kind of um, care that we have to take also, like, is something just that I'm, more, I'm wondering. When we make films and we make things that are so personal to ourselves, I'm also just curious about, like, I think we've all made films here that are very personal to ourselves. Tracy, like, for example, Beans is just, like, uh, just, I mean, it made me feel intense feelings watching it, of course, and just seeing um, those kinds of things. And um, Shandine, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I pronounce your name right. Um, I also was able to watch your short film, Mud, which um, delves into kind of issues around alcoholism and having a parent that has that. So I was just wondering if anyone has kind of like cracked the code or created a way that, um, allows us to kind of think about and take care of our own like mental health when making films that are deeply personal and also 
reliving traumatic sort of instances in a way that I think non-native filmmakers don't always have to perform or um, kind of do. Like it's part of, um, I guess this responsibility as an indigenous filmmaker, you feel the need to kind of be the person who can contextualize this story for a larger audience. But then in the process, you take on a great um, toll. And so I'm just wondering um, what everyone's thoughts are on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I feel like the, the, there's so many different things we did in making beans, um, but very specific to your question. I think first and foremost, it's about who we work with and, and gathering the right team, working with people who understand how sensitive this material is. So with, with my team on beans, I mean, everyone showed up with just their hearts wide open, very aware, very careful and, and followed my lead. So there, there were a lot of decisions we made, for instance, the, the recreations of the really traumatic historical moments. We didn't shoot that within the community. We, we found communities, we found our white neighbors. Um, we went to communities about 45 minutes outside of Kahnawake because I didn't want anyone happening by the set as we were recreating these highly traumatic moments. Um, and, and even so, and for me too, it's about informed consent so that everybody mm -hmm. is aware of, of what we're gonna be taking on. Actors, even before the audition process, know what is going to be asked of them. When we were finding locations, we were, we were letting communities know what we're looking to recreate. All of that is not usual. You don't typically need to do any of that when you're asking, you know, for a street to close, some city street to close. Um, but again, I, I also, I, this was such a traumatic time for this entire province, this entire country. I didn't want anyone surprised to show up as an extra on set and be surprised that they had to play a racist. Um, so. The right. extras knew ahead of time. Um, we had support workers who came. We had some indigenous social workers who were on set with us. We had a PTSD specialist on set with us who, who were there for everyone, not just not just our actors. You know, they were there for anyone who needed that support. And it it occupied a lot, a lot of my attention. A lot of my attention was on how do we do this so that every day. We all feel great leaving set. We all have a good time with the work we're doing. But in the end, when I piece it all together, it's it's going to be it's going to be what it is. And oftentimes it's it's very it's it's there there are hard scenes to watch in the film. But I can tell you while making it, we every day we we left, you know, with high fives and, and feeling good. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to film traumatic scenes um, that don't cause trauma in the making of. I don't think I don't think the end product justifies any means, you know? Um, it's not all about that final product. I feel the making of needs to honor the same goals that we're trying to accomplish with the final film. We need to we need to we need to create with with the same amount of care and energy. Um, and I think we, I think we, we, we did a pretty good job of that on beans, but it, it is, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work and you need the right partners on board who will listen to you and say, okay, we need to do that. Okay. Let's make that happen. As opposed to pushing back. I did, I will say I did have one crew member who did not agree with me and pushed back a lot. And, you know, said one thing that he said to me was Tracy, you don't need to be such a mother hen director. Actors are paid to do what we say. So you, you don't have to you don't have to be so concerned. I can tell you that that was the final straw and I fired him because that's that's not the way I want to create. I, I'll add to Tr Tracy, thank you for sharing that. That's so personal. And I just want to affirm your experience. Um, I made a very personal film as my first narrative feature. Again, many of you probably didn't see it, uh, Naturally Native, uh, because it came out in 1998. Um, but when I wrote it, 
I remember finishing the screenplay and telling my husband, I feel very naked because this is my personal life story, a lot of trauma, a lot of uh, trauma around identity um, and who I am. And what was interesting is as I gathered uh, together a cast and crew of Native people, we had, we had more Native people behind the camera than non-Native. Um, I also started a training program because one of the things that is broken with our system in Hollywood is a pipeline. There are not a lot of places for Indigenous filmmakers to get experience if they want to become um, part of a crew. Where do you get uh, script supervising training or camera angle training or costuming any. And so I created a training program and I had all these interns um, on the set from reservations as well. And by the time we entered the filming phase, it had become their story as much as my story. And so I never felt like it was just about me. Almost every single person who was native on the crew or in it, we also had an all native cast um, had said to me, I, I experienced that same thing in a slightly different way. And so it did become a community story. It was also, and this is very unique, it was also produced and funded by the Manchatuka Pequot tribe. We believe it was the first kind of major feature to be funded by a tribal nation. So this was a true indigenous film. And what was so great is as I felt naked about my story, and I was actually it, it was a PG-13 film, but I was actually naked in a scene as well. You couldn't see anything. But my point is I felt naked figuratively and literally. But as it became a film that supported other artists, I became more like the mother, a uh, nurturer, and, and I really gave my story away. And I gave that story away in a sense that now several of those interns went on and they have careers in Hollywood because they got experience on that film set. And so I think part of what we do as a community is we, we learn to give away so that we can, um, it's the word is Gadugi in Cherokee to do things in a good way for the community. And that's how Wilma lived her life. And so I had to learn that on my first film. And after that, I was always able to kind of step away as the director and storyteller and realize this is not my own this is something that is for the community. And so I, I, it just helped me grow throughout the rest of my filmmaking career. Yeah, definitely. And I'm hearing to, oh, go ahead, Kennedy. Sorry. Kennedy. Oh, no, I was just, I was just going to jump in. Um, I have yeah, a very do. similar story of, of um, being an actress and, and telling other people's stories um, and being more of a voice. Um, it's, it's very interesting because I felt very naked as well, um, but coming from a different end, they're not my stories, but in the end, you really discover something about yourself. And um, being an actress, I, I really try to focus on on compassion and and really getting down deep into who this person is. And that's a big part of why I want to be an actress of, of, of showing like the true like inside the true meaning of this person and something that happened, I think when I was on the set of Once Upon a River is that I discovered myself within all of the characters there. And I, and I think one reason I really love storytelling is because we have all these traumatic experiences and they're very personal to the storytellers and the writers a lot of the time. But I discovered that even the viewer can find themselves within the shoes of these characters. And that's what I think makes movies and television and storytelling so magical. And that's why I really love it and think that we need more of our voices and indigenous stories out there to, to really also show people that, you know, we're deep down, we all have these same pains. We all come from the same cloth. And in the end of the day, like, we all need we all need to come together as like you know one people with very you know very different stories but in the end we all live on this earth and we're all you know a part of one big story and that's something that i really um really enjoy about storytelling and i think you know is is important to tell as well i'll jump in on the last person <laughs> um but yeah, I think 
what all of you guys have said is very key to to being in this world as an indigenous woman specifically and really saying like, how am I gonna take ownership over the creation of my art and not just the, like, the art itself. Um, I'll speak to an opposite experience that I had um, and it was with Mud actually. So Mud was my first writer, director debut. Uh, I was a short film, it was a lower budget um, it was something that was really personal to me, and I think it's uh, it's a really dangerous territory to be in, especially as a, an artist. I think you can really dive into that work and you can like kind of forget the outer world and you can forget all of these things that are going to like help you bring yourself out of it. And so with mud, because it was. Um, such a personal thing and because it was like a low budget thing like it was mostly myself doing uh i mean i had a great crew and they were so loving and so caring and i had indigenous crew members i had everyone who was in front of the camera was uh Diné. um and so it was like only a three-day shoot but like the fact that it just took over my life for like a year um with like pre-production and post-production um, and then it got into Sundance, which I wasn't anticipating at all. Um, and that was a really wild experience for me because I had never shown any of my films to anybody. And then it went from like nothing to like everyone. And then it traveled the world to different film festivals. And to hear, to be at like Q and A's and hear people who are not indigenous talk about my film in a way that felt more stereotypical made me sink like it made me feel awful because it made me think that i created something that um that allowed those stereotypes to perpetuate when my goal was the opposite and it really pushed me into a place that was really dark and really hard to create anything from that point on and it was like just like why didn't i realize that like this is what i wanted to create but in the end i ended up doing something else that might have been damaging and it made me so afraid to create something that was like that could have put my people in like a really horrible place and so um it was traumatic i guess and it made me realize that like exactly what tracy and val and uh kennedy are saying like you have to take ownership over like yourself uh, as a creator and really think about like what am i going to put into my art, like how am I going to like make this a safe process, not just for me, but for my crew. Um, and it made me realize that also <laughs> that maybe looking at non-indigenous people as your audience isn't the way to go. Like I know that for a fact, like when I showed it to people in Gallup, like uh, from Navajo Nation or at indigenous film festivals, people instantly understood the message of the film. Um, but when I showed it to like, prominently like white film festivals. It was just like over their head and they didn't understand it. So I think it really solidified that I want to create art for myself and I don't want to create art that caters towards a non-indigenous audience. And I want people to see up on the screen something that is meaningful and impactful to them. But yeah, I think that's the end. I'm like, sorry, I'm like really bad at like ending my answers. No, not at all. It's it's one of these things that just, I mean, for me, I've made my own content, but I've also worked at a number of um, nonprofits and different institutions that, you know, are like supposed to be going after B, BIPOC kind of creators and content. And sometimes it just feels like we do more harm than good. And I was always the only Native person at all of these places and, you know, having to go through applications and picking projects that you have to be the only person advocating in the room. No, this is really stereotypical and problematic. And I don't think this person is the best person to go into this community. They don't know and tell a story of alcoholism, for example, which, I, you know, it's like, if you don't have a reason to be telling that story in 2021 and you're not native, I just personally don't see the value of it anymore. But, you know, it's like there's certain places and institutions that really still like that kind of content. And so I'm wondering, it's it's like we, w when you're an indigenous creator, I think that we are in the middle of a really beautiful indigenous media renaissance. There's been so much 
amazing cinema, TV shows, film that is for an indigenous audience more so than um, a broader audience. And I'm just wondering like how, you know, what is the place of Hollywood and these media in telling our story? Like how do we use it as a tool without being used by it? Which I think has been the history for so long. I would love to answer that, Cass, given that I have worked um, very closely with Hollywood for many years. Exactly. And I think, I think there's an art form to it. And um, so I have a co-producer on my last three big uh, feature documentaries and her name is Gail Ann Hurd, and she's a Caucasian woman, but she's one of the most successful producers in Hollywood. Her current show is called The Walking Dead. It's been on for, I think, 10 seasons. She also wrote and produced um, the Terminator series way back when, and she's incredible. And she came alongside me to say she wanted to tell this story with me, but she completely trusted me to tell the story as an indigenous woman, and she was there to provide resources mentorship. She helped finance our film um, by way of a Kickstarter campaign, and she used the actors from The Walking Dead, you know, so there's a way to partner that doesn't interfere. And I think that's a broader statement, too, as we look at racial equity and racial justice. We need allies from all walks of life, but they have to be able to understand how, how to elevate our voice and not interfere. And it, it comes down to power dynamics. It's not about um, us being given a small little space in Hollywood over here, and it's still their game and their business. It's really about ownership. And if we can own the story and tell it in the way um, a lot of what Sean Dean was saying really resonated with me, you know, there are some things that audiences just won't understand about reservation life or indigenous life, and that's okay. We have to be allowed to tell our story. And real quick, I'm going to give you a couple of funny examples of kind of what Sean Dean was saying, but it's, it's, a, it's a lighter side of it. There's always people out there trying to interpret what we mean based on heavy, heavy issues and years and years of oppression and sort of non-Indians interpreting things. So my film, my first film was filmed in my home because I didn't have a, lot, a big budget. So I filmed a lot in the kitchen and the bedroom. So a critic wrote a, a complete chapter on the film saying it was clear that Red Horse was showing the oppression of Indian women over the years by keeping them in the kitchen in the bedroom. And it was very symbolic. It was very clear. And, and I had to respond to him, no, it was because I didn't have a budget. It was, it was a pure budget issue. And then I was comparing notes with Chris Eyre, who had smoke signals come out at the same time. And he had a car that was only worked in reverse on the reservation. And a critic wrote, clearly Chris Eyre is thinking about the backward, um, oppression of native people and having this car only go backwards. And Chris says, no, it's transmission is broken. That's the reason it only goes in reverse. And that's like reality on some reservations. It has nothing to do with years of oppression. And so we have to be careful that, you know, some people want to tell our stories. They want to take those stories from us. And we have to just be very firm about ownership and who is telling the story because otherwise there'll be cultural theft. Uh, really quick, I just wanted to jump in on that. Um, I, I have a similar story with Once Upon a River. My director always tells this story, actually, Harula Rose. She talks about how um, in pre-production, she was trying to get funding and trying to get people to, you know, jump on board and, and get the, the movie going. And, and she talked to a big name in, in the industry um, to produce the movie. and he read the story and he looked at her and had this meeting and she thought it was going to be really great. And he looked at her and said, well, I love your story, but why don't we make it about the uncle who, um, if you don't know, once upon a river, the uncle is, he's a, a white male. He's an older white male. And he said, why don't we make it about him? I think it'll really sell. And, you know, we can still get your, your story across, but I will produce, your film if we if we just change the storyline a little bit and and really make the main character the the white male and she looked at him and was like she had to walk away and i thought that story is really powerful because she could have gone with this you know with the bigger name with in hollywood and made a bigger probably a film that would have just moved along a little bit faster and had um, more money for production 
Um, but she stayed strong and she decided, no, I'm going to stick with, you know, my true, like my heart in this film. And we're going to keep it the main character, this, you know, young native woman. And we're going to tell the true story. Um, and I thought that was really powerful and something that really drew me to Harula and, and working with her. And the fact that we just had a really strong female um, crew and cast and it, it was really great. And I think that, you know, the end, at the end of the day, you, you got to stick to your heart and take ownership. I think that's the common thing that we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, you can still create really great work. And if we keep doing that, if, if more of us keep, you know, saying, no, I'm not going to, you know, go with you, I'm going to, I'm going to stand up and make the film I want to make, then I think our, our voices will rise and more of our stories will get out there. Um, yeah, I think both of those points are really important and really contribute or contribute to the conversation about what is Hollywood's role within our space, I guess. And I guess I like to try to think of it as that way is um, that as indigenous people, as creators, we are storytellers um, by tradition, by like years and hundreds of years, thousands of years, we've always been storytellers. And so for us to be ownership, uh, owners of our own space and realize that we can create media from that place and have these allies step in when possible. Um, and I think that's really, um, I guess just like in the way that like we can be going to these structures and feeling like um, we're giving them an opportunity or that they are going to be able to tell our stories in within their space. I think it's really important to look at it from the opposite way is that like we're giving you the opportunity to present our story and really um, like we're the ones who are owners over this. And um, I guess like I like with me, like the end goal isn't just to have Holly have my story be like in this Hollywood system. It's more that like I think about we can be contributors to this system and that we want it to change. Like we don't want it to just stay the same. Like it's so um it it stems from a place that is really racist. Like all of like Hollywood films like started from a really awful place. And so if we can take that and if we can make it our own and really push it to be something else and really push the system to work for us instead of the opposite way around. I think that's the way to go is for, I mean, just so that we can have more ownership over, over our stories. And I know that's really broad <laughs> in, in the sense of like, what are the steps? But I would say that like, I have my own personal experiences of like being approached to make things and having that be like, Oh, like we want this to be like, we just want you to be the indigenous person in this. Like we know that we need an indigenous director because that's the right thing to do in 2021. And it's just like, like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> like, no, that's, and I give it a whole different vibe from when I'm like pitching my own things and realizing like I'm the owner of my own story and realizing like, wow, people like the right people, some people aren't, but the right people respect my space as a storyteller, as a storyteller, they respect my perspective. And those are the people I want to work with. I don't want to be this person who like, is just like a checkbox, I guess. Um, and I think that's a way that a lot of indigenous women work. Like, we might not, it might not be the most conventional, but I think we like, find our way around and it really works for us. So yeah. I'll, I'll jump in on this. I, I just want to share, I want to share um, a small little story about the creation of beans. The, the writing process took around eight years because it was such a personal story. I, there was all these different reasons. It took, it took me the length it took, but I will say in the beginning, this notion that there needs to be white people in the film, there needs to be, you know, the white hero, um, there needs to be the white star that comes on board. If you have any hope of getting money or any hope of people watching it, uh, you know, this is this is something, these are the rules that we have been fed. And so in the very beginning, early stages of writing, I, I forced, you know, that I found, I, I created 
this white character and his white son and forced into the story, completely fictional. The whole story is fictional, I, I will say, uh, but inspired by my my own my own experience. But draft after draft, as I was reading it, there was just this terrible feeling, and and it was I was like, no, this is not the story. This it's not there yet. I'm not. This is not it. And my producer was fantastic in terms of her patience. Um, and finally, it when I really like owned the truth of the story as a 12 year old girl, I didn't know any white people. I grew up on my reserve. I grew up in this very tight knit, tight knit familiar bubble. I didn't know any white people. So it didn't make any sense to the reality of this young girl's coming of age story that all of a sudden there's this prominent sort of white man and white boy in the story. And so once we just like cut those story, cut those characters out, all of a sudden now there was all the room as well to just really go into what I wanted to talk about and and just own as 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 you've all stated, just own the story for what it is. And what's been amazing is once we did that, once and once we presented that, um, we did have all of the partners come on board with enthusiasm and and we're we're excited to support this story, excited to support this perspective. Um, and there was never any, there was never any um, pressure from any of them to be, to, to say, well, maybe we can have a white character in there. Maybe we can get a star in there. It was never said. And so I, I was really encouraged by that. You know, I do think the allies are coming around. They are there. Um, and I and I think they're coming around more and more because I I've also had the meetings of of the projects the projects being pitched that you read you read either the the treatment or you read the script and you're like oh my god no uh, and and now I'm getting more and more calls to come in at the very beginning as opposed to they've they figured it all out and they think it's amazing and it's so not. I'm getting the calls to come in at the very beginning and build something from the ground up, um, which honors which honors everything that we have to offer. So it's it's exciting. I feel like Hollywood, and I and I, I credit the streamers. I think the streamers have really opened things up. They're telling stories that are very um, world specific, community specific, and they're getting massive global audiences. So this notion that it has to be led by white people. I mean, we we have the proof now that that is not the case. So I do see movement and it's it's exciting. Yeah, it definitely is. It's it's like there's an uncomfortable there's like an uncomfortableness with not seeing yourself on the screen, but then that's what indigenous people and people of color in general have been saying for a long time is well we don't see ourselves on screen at all or when we do. It's like, you know, dances with wolves or you know, really like dated cartoons and how do you think that makes, you know, people feel who are those characters or caricatures or stereotypes? Um, well, plus, and, plus yeah. if, you know, for, for, for decades, we all tune in and watch shows and movies that are completely led by white people. We all, we all go on the ride. We can connect because it's a human experience. So if we can all, if people of color can watch and enjoy films and stories that are dominated by white people, white people, the, the opposite has to also be true. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I just wanted to also touch upon really quickly, because I think unfortunately we're going to have to wrap it up um, pretty soon, but also a big theme that I'm also hearing is we are fortunate to have all women, women directors, women, people behind the camera and storytellers. And so much of this idea of film is based in like cis hetero male ego, like this idea that the director can manipulate the stars. And, you know, there's a huge history of actresses and actors, but mostly actresses being manipulated and, you know, just, brutalized by these directors for the sake of art. So I really do appreciate um, 
the the points that everyone has made that that doesn't have to be the way that filmmaking is and it's not from an indigenous worldview and ontology either we didn't feel the need to exploit people it's part of this capitalist exploitation um that i think that you know as we reclaim storytelling which is our birthright it's our oral history um it's just a really it's just great to hear all these stories of resistance and you know tracy and val as someone who's been in the industry for a long time just it's great to hear and be reaffirmed that you can still make content in the way that you want to in a holistic reciprocity kind of forward way um so thank you for that too um I, like i said unfortunately we have to wrap up but i'd love to um, make space for anyone if they have something that they wanted to say and they didn't get a chance to um i'd like to leave that space open i'd love to make a closing statement um thank you every one of you for being here. This was an honor. And I look at so many of you, even Tracy, you're all, like I said, younger than I am. And I do believe the change we wanna see will come from the younger generation. I feel that one of the big differences I see, my daughter is 22, graduating from Stanford in about a month and she wants to be a filmmaker. And what I see in her generation is the appreciation of the non-trauma items. All of us, I think in our generation, we're so traumatized that all of our films have a little bit of that trauma and that need to show that, which I think is important. That's not a criticism, but my daughter gravitates to humor and what she sees that it's a different lens from that generation who believes in, in the community, but also sees the happy points and the humor and the contemporary sort of you know, multiracial uh, community. There's so many different combinations at this point and it's, it's not a heaviness. And so I just celebrate young filmmakers who are able to, um, I hope, you know, hope that maybe some of us have paved the way where they can really enjoy the storytelling experience. And so just bravo to everyone who, I wanna encourage everyone who's young uh, and, and if I can be a mentor, you know, please reach out to me, but I, I love our future generations. Um, Val, I would love to just comment after that. Um, that is one of my big goals being a, a young actress, especially on and Once Upon a River, we would go to festivals and, and we do these Q and A's and we always get questions. I would be with Tatanka Means and Ajwak and we'd get questions about uh, about the trauma that's in this film and, and oh, just this like the need to bring up the trauma of being an indigenous actor and um one thing that we agreed upon the three of us was you know what we really liked about this film is that we're just happen to be you know indigenous and, and native and telling this this story and, and there's pain in it but it's it's pain that you know we can all tell but there's it's there's humor and we're all people, and I think one of my big things is is I lo I love these stories that we're t we're telling the trauma of you know of our our land and our people, but also getting to that that funny side, getting to the just at the end of the day, we're you know like everyone else. It's not about you know we can laugh and we can we have love stories and and um, we go on adventures like that's. You know, I, I love a good coming of age adventure movie too. And I think that's what I really wanna see a lot of more indigenous and native people in is just common stories, like our everyday lives. That's, that's something that we don't see often. And that's something that I think is really needed. So I really appreciate that you just said that as well. And yeah, thank you so talking. much for, you know, letting us be here. And I really enjoyed being a part of this panel. So thank you. Yeah, we're talking about nuanced perspectives. Indigenous people can have nuanced experiences, be nuanced people. We don't all look one way and have the same story. And um, some of us do have traumatic things and that also doesn't have to define us. We can talk about our trauma and we can also be more than that too. We can deal with it and we also exist and have lives and <laughs> create and have laughter and joy. So yeah, I totally agree. I'll go. Uh, yeah, just definitely thank you for saying that, Val. I think that's really important. I think dimensionality is so important within the future. And I think more than anything, it allows people to respect us as people who aren't otherworldly or um, distant. And I think 
that's going to be the real solution to being able to tell these stories that really hit um, and really, I guess, just get people to be interested in indigenous ways or indigenous philosophies or that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate being on this panel with everybody. I think you guys all have really important things to say and really, really well put. Um, I'm not so much well put myself, but yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Athena Film Festival for putting us together and showing just what different kinds of art that we can all create um, and that we're not all coming off from the same place. I know we're pretty much out of time. I, I am just going to echo what everyone said and thank you so much for being here. It's always so inspiring to be able to connect and converse with other indigenous creatives. The work is often so solitary uh, and often I'm collaborating with a lot of non-Indigenous people because we are still building our communities. Our communities are still scattered. So it's just been really wonderful. And um, you're all inspirational. And thank you for doing what you're doing. And I can't wait to see what comes next for all of you. <laughs>